Okay, everybody, well, welcome to uh, today's uh, talk on a continuing series on approach to the clinical diagnosis of acid base disorders. And uh, today there's another interesting case that I'll present to you, somewhat complicated, but there are a lot of interesting teaching points. So this is a 62-year-old female uh, who had a history of lower abdominal pain, chronic difficulty, uh, voiding, uh, confusion and vomiting, and she had a past medical history of uh, diabetes, hypertension, and recurrent urinary abnormalities. Um, and then on exam, she was drowsy with a blood pressure 160 over 100. Blood pressure fell uh, when she uh, stood up. JVP was flat. Uh, her pulse, sorry, there's a typo there, was 100. And when she was sitting, uh, it went uh, to 130. So this is actually a figure from a paper, uh, and uh, it's a little confusing, but uh, that, that accounts for the, the granularity of the, of the image, but hopefully, hopefully you can read it. Um, okay, uh, so on admission, the patient had a sodium of 118, uh, and you can see 12 hours later was basically back to normal. Um, the bicarbonate, was 17 from the blood gases. Remember, we don't call the number that we get from the chemistries bicarbonate. It's the total CO2, but the bicarbonate was 17 and stayed around the same, so slightly decreased. And at 24 hours, it was almost back to normal. Remember, this is a female, so the normal bicarbonate uh, in a female is not 25, it's lower, it's around 23. So almost back to normal. But notice the anion gap. The anion gap was 41 on admission and then fell uh, by 24 hours later down to uh, 15. The albumin, which is important to check because remember the anion gap is in part dependent on what the albumin is. Uh, albumin accounts for the greatest number of unmeasured negative charges. And we'll get into that in a little bit on subsequent slides, but you can see the albumin was normal and fell a little bit by 24 hours. The pH was 7.33. Remember, we don't look at the pH to diagnose acid base disorders, uh, but the pH is important, which I've mentioned in previous talks, because the anion gap is also dependent on the pH because the, the charge on albumin, which is negative at pH 7.4, isn't fixed. It depends not only on the albumin concentration in an absolute sense, but it also depends on the pH. So independent of the acid-base disorder, every time you acidify the blood, you protonate albumin and decrease the charge on albumin and the anion gap falls. So the anion gap actually, if nothing else happened, would be decreased in a metabolic acidosis or a respiratory acidosis because the proton per se protonates the albumin and lowers the charge. And similarly, uh, when you alkalinize the blood, you deprotonate albumin and the chart, the negative charge on albumin increases. So in metabolic alkalosis and in respiratory alkalosis, independent of everything else, the anion gap is, is increased. So that's just something to keep in mind. And there's algorithms that you can use, which we won't get into today, to tell you for a given change in pH, how much the, the charge on albumin uh, should be affected, or if you want to think more globally, how much the anion gap should change from its original level. So there's a pH dependent change uh, in the charge on albumin, and then as a correlate of that, the anion gap. So always keep that in mind. And the PCO2 is 38. Uh, these units are in millimoles per liter or milligrams per deciliter because of the, the, the paper actually came from Canada where they use uh, different units than we use. Uh, the blood sugar was significantly elevated on admission and then fell by a day later, almost to normal. Okay, so let's first, there's a lot of things going on here. The most glaring is this huge increase in the anion gap, but let's again do what we do each week and let's approach the acid-base diagnosis first of all. So again, we focus on the bicarbonate and the bicarbonate is decreased. And so it's one of three acid-base disorders. It's either a metabolic acidosis, an acute respiratory alkalosis or a chronic respiratory alkalosis. We look at the change in 
the bicarbonate from its original level, which we don't know, but it's a female, so we assume it's 23. So the bicarbonate fell by about six. If it's a metabolic acidosis that's compensated, the PCO2 should fall by about the same amount. And here we see the PCO2 is actually, in a female, the normal PCO2 is around 38. So the PCO2 didn't change. So if it is a metabolic acidosis, which we don't know, but if it is, then they're all, it cannot be just a metabolic acidosis that's compensated. There must also be a respiratory acidosis. Now remember that if the PCO2 should be about, in this example, five or so less than the original level because the bicarbonate fell by about five, remember it didn't fall by eight because the normal bicarbonate in a female is not 25 fell roughly just doing population um, means assume when we, again, it's better to know what the patient is, but without knowing that you just have to assume that the, P, the bicarbonate in a female, if you take a thousand females is about 23. So this fell on average by five, this should fall by about five. And it didn't, it didn't change at all. Uh, this would be the normal PCO2 for the popular, for a population of a thousand females. If you did the average of what the PCO2 is, it would be about this. So you don't just call this then a metabolic acidosis, nor do you say it's uncompensated. The correct acid-based terminology would be there's a metabolic acidosis and a respiratory acidosis. In other words, the lack of compensation in a metabolic acidosis or metabolic alkalosis for that matter implies that you also have a respiratory acid-based disorder. So it's not sufficient to just write on the chart, not compensated properly. You actually would have two acid-based disorders. So if you're right, and we don't know we're right, if we postulate that there's a metabolic acidosis as a cause for the drop in bicarbonate, there must also, it cannot be a simple acid-based disorder. There must also be a respiratory acidosis. Now, what about the second cause in general of a fall in bicarbonate? Could this be an acute respiratory alkalosis? Well, remember that for every 10 fall in the PCO2 as a cause of the respiratory alkalosis, the bicarbonate falls one to two, one to two milliequivalents per liter. And remember from previous talks, that is just what happens because of the bicarbonate buffer reaction. That does not require a kidney or any other organs. It, the same thing would occur if you have the same buffer capacity in a solution in vitro. If you opened up a bottle of Coca-Cola, uh, with the same other non-bicarbonate buffers that are in the human body, you would have the same findings that the for every 10 fall in the PCO2 as the carbon dioxide left the bottle, if you measured the bicarbonate, it would all it would fall by one to two milliequivalents per liter. And that's just a chemical reaction that occurs and based on all the buffers that are present in addition to the not in, in addition to the bicarbonate buffer system. It does not require organ transport or physiology. Well, could we have that here? And the answer is we can't. The PCO didn't fall at all. So how could the fall on the PCO2 acutely account for this? Well, it can't. So that rules out acute respiratory alkalosis. What about chronic respiratory alkalosis? Well, for every 10 fall on the PCO2 for four or five days, in addition to that acute fall that you get from the fall that I just talked about that would occur in vitro, there's a further fall in the bicarbonate by about three above what occurred acutely so that the total fall is about five milliequivalents or millimoles per liter for every 10 fall in the PCO2. And that uh, that further fall of three does require an organ. It requires the kidney. We won't get into that today, what the kidney is doing. The simplistic thought would be that the kidney is excreting bicarbonate. That is only part of the story. There's actually changes in ammonia excretion and proton excretion. And it's a little complicated, but the total fall empirically from its original level is five. One to two is from that acute uh, shift in the bicarbonate buffer reaction where bicarbonate's consumed. And the other further fall is from what occurs in the kidney. But again, that can't be what's going on here because the PCO2 didn't even change from normality. So we're really left after going through this logically. Again, first, noting that the, there's a fall in bicarbonate, then the next thought is what are the three acid-based disorders that make it fall? Going through each of those, it's clear that the only thing that would make sense is a metabolic acidosis in addition to a respiratory acidosis.
Now, we have an elevated elevation in the anion gap. That would be a secondary clue that we have a metabolic acidosis of the so-called elevated anion gap type. That's because every time we have an anion coming into the body endogenously, it always comes with a proton. We never see ketone bodies or lactate or any other endogenous anion coming in with sodium or potassium. If they did, the, the anion gap would go up, but you wouldn't get an acid-base change, right? To get the acid-base change, you have to have a proton coming in with the anion. And remember, as we always say, the anion that comes into the blood is not causing the metabolic acidosis. It's a surrogate clue that you had a proton entering the body uh, with the anion at the same time but it's not causal as far as change in the bicarbonate concentration. So we have the anion gap uh, of 41. Let's assume the anion gap at maximum, uh, if you look at a huge population, would be 15. And, that, and that's even on the high side. It's usually about 11 or 12. Again, as we talked about in previous talks, it depends on the hospital and also um, to a large extent on how they measure the chloride because there's some hospitals that... The machine they use gives a chloride that's higher than uh, would be at UCLA, and the anion gaps normally can actually be 9 or 10. So let's assume it's 12, something like that. This is significantly elevated. Uh, it's it's up, you know, you take 41 and, and subtract 12 from it, you're going to get 29. Well, we still have something interesting because remember what I said in previous talks that to find out what the original bicarbonate was prior to the anion gap metabolic acidosis, what nephrologists typically do, even though there's a lot of uh, problems with doing it and because there's a lot of subtleties involved, as I talked about before, of the volume of distribution of anions that are coming in being the same as protons, that the excretion of the anion in the urine uh, is, is equal to the renal bicarbonate generation a rate. There's a lot of assumptions, but assuming that for every increase in the anion gap, the bicarbonate falls one. And again, that is not actually what occurs in, in real life, but may, but many attendings will, will actually ask you to do it. And also you may find it's on your exam. In the back of your mind, you have to know that it's a, it's a very inaccurate cal calculation. But at any rate, let's just go through it. Um, for learning's sake. So if you add the change in the bicarb in the anion gap, which let's assume is 29, we don't know that for certain because we don't know the original anion gap, but let's say it was 12. You take the 29 and you add it to the 17, you're obviously not going to get 25. You're going to get a number which is much greater than that, which even with the assumptions that we just talked about, there's you're going to get a number above, above 25. It might be 30, 35, 40. If you add the 29 to the 36, you can calculate it's going to be 40 something. So now we have to account for why the bicarbonate, when we add the two together, is not 25. If you get a number above 25, it means that there's something else causing hyperbicarbonatemia had, had the metabolic acidosis not been there. And, and that you have to account for and give it an acid-based diagnosis. The most likely cause would be a, a severe metabolic alkalosis. Now, it's possible also to raise the bicarbonate to that extent by having a chronic respiratory acidosis. Both of those will raise the bicarbonate. We don't know because we don't have prior pre PCO2s. We do know that the patient was vomiting clinically. That may account for um, why the bicarbonate, if we do the calculation, came out to be higher than 25. The patient also had a metabolic alkalosis. So just looking at everything at face value, the correct response on an exam at a bare minimum would be that you have three acid-based disorders here. You have an anti-gap metabolic acidosis, you have a respiratory acidosis, and you must also have a metabolic alkalosis. Now, the way I phrased that was intentional. You cannot tell what came first. So, and you shouldn't use the word superimposed as we've talked about a number of times. You just state what all the, the acid-based disorders that your mind can come up with that would account for the numbers. What came first, what came second is impossible to say. It could be two occurred simultaneously, one, one occurred after those two, three occurred sequentially in some sort of order. There's no temporal information here. You just have a snapshot in time. We're not looking at a, at a video when we look at those admission numbers. So the correct answer would be those three. Now, it could also be 
that the elevated bicarbonate that we calculated was due to a chronic respiratory acidosis, but we don't have any uh, evidence for that. Nothing and nothing in the clinical scenario that would could account for that, like COPD patient on a ventilator who was being hypoventilated for some reason. We have vomiting, so that would be just statistically the likeliest cause of why when we add the change in the anion gap to the current bicarbonate, we don't get 25, we get a number above that. So the patient could have had a metabolic alkalosis too. But look what happened. The anion gap fell back to approximately a normal number. Uh, the bicarbonate went up a little bit, but really nothing much changed. The biggest change from the original level was this fall in the, in the, in the anion gap. So let's uh, go further and see what might be going on. This just shows pictorially what happened. The patient was given two liters of saline over an hour, given some insulin, thought to have ketoacidosis with that high blood sugar and the high anion gap. Uh, and uh, what you see is the following. The anion gap came down very nicely, but the bicarbonate did not change. And I'm gonna focus on that uh, in a little bit. The reason to focus on that is typically what would happen would be that when the anion gap decreases, the plasma bicarbonate should be increasing. Now, why does that occur? We'll talk about that, but that, that would occur because the anions have carboxyl groups on them, beta-hydroxybutyrate, acetoacetate. And when these anions can enter, again, the Krebs cycle in the liver, in the Krebs cycle, you, you generate bicarbonate from those carboxyl groups. We know clinically that happens all the time. We have lactate and TPN, as I've mentioned a number of times. We use, sorry, we have lactate in, in peritoneal dialysate, and we're, we're taking advantage of the thought that the lactate will be converted in the liver in our, in our patients on PD into bicarbonate. We don't put bicarbonate in the bag because we'll form chalk, we'll form calcium carbonate, and you'll get a precipitate because the solution will be so alkaline. So it's a trick that is used clinically for a number of years already to keep a solution with a compound that could be potentially converted into bicarbonate, but that doesn't change the pH of the solution. We use the same thing when we have acetate and TPN solutions. We could have, we could use lactate. You know, a lot of these things are historic. We use citrate when we're treating kids with RTA or sometimes adults where we don't want to give bicarbonate so the same sort of thought is whenever you give a carbox, something with an organic anion, uh, by definition, they have carboxyl groups. Those carboxyl groups are neutralized in the or oxidized in the liver into bicarbonate. But we have a interesting situation here. We have a fall in the anion gap and the bicarbonate is staying the same. And we'll talk about uh, what might be going on in just a second. Now let's back up a little bit to medical school and residency and think of what occurs when we're looking at these charges in what we call the anion gap, which is a clinical construct. It's not a, it's not a biochemical or chemical construct. It's just a creation of the human mind because of what we measure and don't measure. If we, but ideally we would measure everything, which we don't. So the question is, what are the positive and negative charges in any solution, typically blood, this could be CSF fluid, it could be urine, it could be anything. The values would be different, but we would be looking more or less at the same uh, ions. The major one, major cations are in this first line and the major anions are in this line. We have something called OA, which are organic anions. Um, and that those are some of the things I just talked about. Beta-hydroxybutyrate, acetoacetate, lactate. There's a whole slew of organic anions in the blood. Uh, in addition, there's albumin. Albumin can actually contributes to the major uh, extent of what we don't measure as far as the negative charges. It's the major component. So if we just do this arbitrary um, algebra, which is just a phenomenon of what evolved in nephrology and in, in clinical medicine, if we take some of the things we measure and subtract them, we're going to end up with everything else we don't measure and subtract those two things and divide them up into negative and positive charges. So if arbitrarily we take the sodium and the chloride and the bicarbonate and get the difference and don't measure anything else, we're gonna end up with the sum of all the anions that we don't measure minus the cations, which we don't measure. So the anions that we're not including here 
are phosphate, sulfate, albumin, lactate, whatever else we're not measuring, we, we throw into here. But it's important to remember clinically and just algebraically, this isn't just equal to the unmeasured anions as many, many residents and fellows think. It's also, you must subtract off the unmeasured cations just mathematically. It, it's incorrect if you just look at this, unless this is zero, but we know the potassium, calcium, mag, and, and IgG are not don't add up to zero. So this number can't be zero. So this includes calcium, mag, and IgG predominantly. IgG is positively charged, remember that. That's why in multiple myeloma, due to IgG going up, your anion gap actually decreases because this difference decreases if this increases or in severe hypercalcemia and hypermagnesemia. If those cations came in with chloride, if they came in with sulfate, then the unmeasured anions go up also. So the difference won't change in, in, in those patients with hypermagnesemia and hypercalcemia. But the point being here is that this difference that we're so used to looking at is actually equal to this. And changes here are going to be occurring with changes here because you can't have changes on the right side occurring without changes on the left side or your blood will spark. I mean, you can't, you have to always maintain electron neutrality. Everything here added up must equal everything here in any solution. So let's think about what might be happening in our patient. The anion gap was calculated by this. Now, typically most MDs would say, oh, there must be an, an, an increase in the unmeasured anions. Well, it could be that this didn't change and the unmeasured cations went down, but we'll show how that can't account for the anion gap in this patient of this magnitude. Dropping the unmeasured cations can increase your anion gap as calculated as how we always calculate it. It may not be an increase in unmeasured anions, but this only can affect things to a certain extent. Just we'll show Matt because of the normal concentration of these things. The question is, if these three went to zero, what's the greatest, how much could the anion gap go up? So we'll, we'll look at that now. So let's look at all the numbers and break it up into the numbers we typically measure, the sodium, bicarbonate, and chloride. But when we do that subtraction, it must equal this anion total minus this cation total. So here they are. The anion total is phosphate, sulfate, organic anions, and the charge on albumin, which is 16, actually, negative 16. When you add all this up, 16 plus 6 is 22, plus 3 is 25, roughly. 25 must, at minus these together is 15, which is roughly what the anion gap is. It's a little on the high side. The albumin here might not be 16. It might be 14 or 13. Uh, that's a, that's an estimate. We're not actually measuring the charge on albumins based on research papers where people come up with equations to calculate, knowing the albumin, what the charge on it is. But at any rate, you can see here that if forgetting the sodium chloride and bicarbonate, if we just add up all the anions minus all the cations, we get about 15. So it, let's just say you have a patient and you ask, could my anion gap have gone up because my cations decreased. Well, if, if the cations went to zero, these unmeasured cations, the most the anion gap could go up would be by eight, right? Without changing the unmeasured anions, without changing lactate, beta-hydroxybutyrate, acetoacetate, albumin, keeping all that fixed, just lowering the unmeasured cations will raise your anion gap. But the most it can go up if, if everything went to zero would be by eight roughly, which you're never gonna see clinically. So for practical purposes, change, a decrease in the cat, unmeasured cations don't change your anion gap clinically. There's just a nice thought process experiment to go through in our particular patient with an anion gap of 41 to start with. There have to be, or you would think just simplistically, there must be a ton of unmeasured anions floating around, okay? So getting back to our patient, anion gap, sky high, went to about normal in, in, in a day. The bicar But that happened without the bicarbonate going up as we would have predicted. 
And these were organic anions and they were converted into bicarbonate like you would see in a patient with ketoacidosis or lactic acidosis. When they were lactic acidosis, same thing. The lactate's converted into bicarbonate. That's why the bicarbonate goes up on its own without giving bicarbonate. If you can fix the heart, get the perfusion going, that sort of thing, the liver will convert the lactate back to bicarbonate without you having to give exogenous bicarbonate. But that didn't happen here. So we have two questions really that you should be thinking about. What could possibly be raising the anion gap that high? And if it was an organic anion and the anion gap came back to normal, why didn't the bicarbonate go back to normal? And in this case, way above normal because the anion gap fell by 26. The bicarbonate should have gone up by 26. It should be 48, leaving us just with our metabolic alkalosis. We didn't see that. So what they did is they measured the anions to see if, if what, what are the components of the anion gap. And what you see here is the anion gap was for, same thing as shown before, just shown on the top line. Lactate was up a tiny bit and hardly changed. So this is not due to lactate. Beta hydroxybutyrate, as you might have expected, if this was severe ketoacidosis with the high blood sugar, hardly did anything. Acetoacetate, same sort of thing. Phosphate was up a bit and fell, but that can't account for it. Albion, the estimated charge was 16 and stayed roughly the same. The albumin dropped a little bit. That could just be dilution from all the volume the patient got. Certainly in that period of time, most likely just from dilution. But when you do the math and say, okay, here's all the anions that I know about, and you add them up, and you subtract from the anion gap, you get this you know, calculation that you can say there's missing charges here. The, the charge that you would predict from the anion gap is 14 higher than your measured charges. Whereas after 12 hours and the next day, the charges that were measured did account for, essentially did account for the anion gap. So this first day is a very strange. We have sky high anion gap, and we know that there's nothing at least we know about that's measurable that we measured that can account for this. This just shows what I was saying before, that we would have expected if this was due to lactate or any other organic anion, that when they're oxidized, you get this reaction occurring. This is a net reaction of the Krebs cycle. Well, the lactate first has to be converted to pyruvate. Lactate won't enter the Krebs cycle. But when the pyruvate enters, you get bicarbonate generated. And the same thing would occur with beta-hydroxybutyrate or acetoacetate, whenever they're metabolized, when you correct the clinical abnormality, you give insulin and ketoacidosis or correct the perfusion and the lactic acidosis, the organic anion is a good thing because it's, it's, it's a source of bicarbonate for you without you having to give bicarbonate. But that obviously didn't, doesn't look like it occurred here. The bicarbonate's staying the same. So how could, how could this be falling and this stay the same? Should be bothering you. Well, the other thing to look at is the urine. Could it be that the anions were just falling and ending up in the urine? I've shown you cases like that before, where you have patients with ketoacidosis who have a normal anion gap. Just to start, they have a normal anion gap, not even with therapy. And they have a normal anion gap because, yes, the cells are making beta-hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate, but they're not building up in the blood because the patient has a great GFR and the ketone bodies are in the urine and everyone thinks it's RTA or diarrhea or something else. No, I mean, patients with ketoacidosis who are volume replete and have a good GFR, who don't have a severe osmotic diuresis from, from uh, the hyperglycemia and who aren't vomiting, don't have, can have a normal anion gap or the anion gap can go up very little. And remember what we were saying in previous talks, do not use the anion gap to assess the severity of the of the production, the production of the ketone bodies, because the blood level that you get depends on the excretion rate also. Like all of nephrology, we're looking at input versus output, and the blood levels depend on the output also. Same with you know, type 4 RTA and hyperkalemia. You can have normal, a patient with type 4 RTA who has a normal potassium if they're on a low potassium intake. You can have a patient with, with the 
for instance, uh, let's say sarcoidosis or any other cause of bone resorption that you think would be causing hypercalcemia. But if you have severe hypercalcemia and the calcium is coming out in the urine, despite whatever intake, whatever input you have going into the blood, your blood calcium can be normal. So it's the same sort of thing here. So could this be that the anions that were coming in here uh, fell because something was done and now the renal functions better and the anions are in the urine. Now, remember that could account for why the bicarbonate didn't go up because the loss of organic anions, if this was organic anions or in a patient with ketoacidosis, let's say who came in with an elevated anion gap and the ketone bodies were floating around, but now the anion gap fell because you gave the patient volume, you're losing a source of bicarbonate there. So the, the, if these anions did get into the urine, if there were floating anions around here, and the anion gap fell because of that, that could account for why the bicarbonate didn't go up. You can't have the bicarbonate going up if you're losing the organic anions in the urine. They're not going to enter the Krebs cycle. So then the question is, could that be? Could these or, uh, anions be in the urine? So they measured the anions in the urine. They measured the beta, beta hydroxybutyrate. They measured lactate. And that cannot account for it. I mean, if you look over time here, the beta hydroxybutyrate in the urine stayed the same. The lactate didn't change. They weren't even elevated to be to begin with at time zero when the anion gap was severely elevated. So that thought that we would see much more commonly clinically to account for this, giving volume, getting the GFR improved, the anions coming out in the urine and therefore not being metabolized into bicarbonate is not what's occurring here. So urinary excretion of whatever was in the blood, at least these three things, we don't know there might be other things, cannot account for it. And they looked at other things called net charge of the urine, which we won't get into now. So what have we learned from this case? We've learned that the anion gap cannot be accounted for by anything that they've measured, the typical things one would measure if one could, and that the falling anion gap was in, the, the falling anion gap was not converted to bicarbonate and that the anions and bicarbonate were not in the urine, at least what they measured. And this was a case in nephron, if you want to read about it. There's a number of you know, some cases since then. Uh, and this just recaps what was going on. So on the last slide, I want to just show what might be causes that you should think about. How can we account for all this data? What are the possible causes? It's the one co possible reason uh, is that there were organic anions floating around, but nothing that the lab could measure. We have thousands of organic anions floating around. Clinically, we always think of ketone bodies and lactate, but there are thousands in our blood. Is it possible that there was one that uh, was floating around that we didn't measure? We talked about a few weeks ago of severe chronic Tylenol use that can lead to pyroglutamic acidemia. We didn't measure that here. Maybe, maybe not. Patient wasn't on, at least known to be on Tylenol. This is way before that phenomenology was known clinically or written up in the last 15 years. But it could be that there's some organic anion that was floating around that was not measured. It could be an anion floating around that again was not measured and that is also not metabolized to bicarbonate. What that would be, I can't think of, but it's, at least it's conceptually possible and should be something that your mind uses to explain the phenomenology. Another thing that people don't think about that we sort of alluded to in previous talks is that, is that the volume of distribution of anions, bicarbonate and protons are different. And we always assume they're the same, but it is possible that whatever was done clinically by giving volume, insulin, whatever it was, was shifting ions into a larger volume of distribution than the bicarbonate. Or we were getting other funny things like um, exchanges with cations for chloride that if you do the summations can account for this too. 
So funny exchanges that occur across the cells that we won't get into or differences in volume of distribution could account for why we're seeing this potentially. It could be, for instance, that the anion was going into the cell in exchange for chloride coming out, and we wouldn't see that with a change in the extracellular bicarbonate. It could also be what they ended up actually thinking was the most likely, but is actually the strangest, is that the charge on albumin for some reason was changing over time and that the normal algorithms we use to say that albumin at four grams per deciliter has a charge on average of about 15, 16 milliequivalents per liter is not valid in this case, that there's something going on in this patient that was deprotonating albumin significantly when the patient first came in. So that albumin is accounting for this large increase in the anion gap that we're measuring because its inherent charge became negative charge became greater. And they talk about what some potential causes are. The bottom line is they concluded the most likely change is the most likely cause is that the charge on albumin changed significantly here and the therapy decreased it, at least accounting for the major changes. But why the charge on albumin was so high to begin with, they just, you know, discuss theoretically, they hypothesize they don't know. Now, this is obviously a complicated case, but if you read it and go through it and understand all the subtleties, there's a lot of excellent teaching points in it that you can go through. And it'll also help organize your thinking when you're approaching the anion gap, when you're approaching dynamic changes like a patient with ketoacidosis and lactic acidosis. Don't just focus on the change in the anion gap therapeutically. Focus on what's happening to the bicarbonate because keeping all things constant, the bicarbonate should go up as the anion gap falls unless the anions come into the urine. And that happens a lot because a lot of our therapy actually paradoxically causes the body to dump the organic anions into the urine. And that's great, at least in, when you think initially, oh, my anion gap's falling. But it's not good for correcting the acid-base disorder because now what you've done is you've caused a loss of potential bicarbonate. And that's why paradoxically, when you're treating ketoacidosis or other organic acidoses and you improve the GFR or the GFR was great to begin with, you lose the organic anions in the urine. And in those patients, you actually have to give more bicarbonate than you would otherwise to correct the metabolic acidosis. So I, I think I'll stop there today. Try to get that initial paper out. If you can't find it, nephron might not go back that far. I'm not quite sure. But if you have trouble finding it, let me know. I don't know of any cases since then. I'm sure there are. That was the original case described by Mitch Halpern and his colleagues uh, in Toronto. He also came up with the idea of using the urine anion gap to assess what the ammonium is in the urine in patients with metabolic acidosis, specifically RTA. But now, of course, at UCLA, for the last year or so, we we're, were able to measure the ammonium in the urine. Okay, I think I'll stop there. Uh, does anyone have any questions about this case or anything that I've covered today? Okay, everyone, thanks for joining and uh, have a great rest of the day.